This is the last of the four-part series on pediatric EEG. It will be conducted in a question and answer format. The first question is, look at this epoch and select the best answer. A. Ictal activity. B. Mood rhythm. C. Siganet rhythm. D. Frontal arousal rhythm. The answer is D. Next question. Which of the following is not true regarding frontal arousal rhythm? A. Runs lasting up to 20 seconds. B. Frequency 7 to 20 hertz. C. Harmonics may be present. D. More frequent in children with cerebral dysfunction. Frontal arousal rhythm is a normal pattern and as such it is not more often seen in patients with mental retardation than in normal children. Frontal arousal rhythm must be distinguished from frontal spikes. It obviously occurs during sleep or drowsiness. That is, it occurs during a stage one, stage two, and stage three. Frontal arousal rhythm is often accompanied by clinical or polygraphic evidence of arousal. It is best appreciated during double, using double banana montage, especially if transverse chains are added. Reference montage to ipsilateral ear often helps in the analysis of frontal arousal rhythm. The waveforms constituting the rhythm are apical and at times associated with a small notch in the second half of the wave, but often the prevalent waveform is a simple spike or a sharp wave. The amplitude of these waveforms is in the 75 to 150 microvolts range. Frontal arousal rhythm is often apicular in one side presenting the base of the fundamental rhythm on top. Therefore, it looks notch on one side, that is the side of the superharmonics of the fundamental rhythm and is spiky on the other side. The duration of the burst is 20 seconds or less. I am introducing this epoch at this point using an ipsilateral ear reference montage to show you the intermittent or bursting nature frequently encountered in this pattern and also to highlight the apicular configuration of some of the waves in a burst. Here I have enlarged those waves so you can appreciate them better. And also to show you in this new frame that I have lighted waveforms that have a basic frequency with superimposed harmonics. Again, I have highlighted this structure so you can see it better. Notice that these waveforms look like 
an inverted sawtooth wave, the little hump being behind the big bump. As you can see, the frequency of this waveform during the burst is in the 7 to 21 hertz range. The activity is frontal, usually synchronous, and as you can see, negative. It is also symmetrical. Frontal arousal rhythm stops with deeper sleep or open awakening. The defining feature of this rhythm are its frontal predominance, its frequency of 7 to 20 Hz, its occurrence during a sleep, and that often is followed by arousal. So the answer to this question is D. Next question. Frontal arousal rhythm and initial arousal responses have the same EEG correlate. A true, B false. The transition from a sleep or drowsy pattern to awake patterns are called arousal responses. At times, they consist of a rather seamless trans transition between a sleep pattern and a wake EEG pattern. In these cases, the percentage of posterior dominant rhythm or alpha rhythm increases until it occupies over 50% of the epoch. Yet at times, this transition is more exciting as it occurs with the appearance of paroxysmal hypnopompic hypersynchronicity. It is important to stress that also at times a full arousal may not follow this activity. Instead, there is a return to sleep patterns. Such a turn of event does not preclude labeling the event as paroxysmal hypnopompic hypersynchronicity. This is an example of paroxysmal hypnopompic hypersynchronicity. Notice the increased amplitude of the waves after the aqua arrow, which marks an arousing stimulus. And also notice the presence of muscle artifact during the last seconds of the epoch. The increase in muscle artifact is a sign of arousal. In addition to paroxysmal hypnopompic hypersynchronicity, another type of arousal response is the appearance of desynchronization. The synchronization appears where the previous dominant rhythm was that typical of a regular rhythmic EEG pattern of sleep. A fourth type of arousal response is the presence of frontal arousal response to which we have alluded just a few seconds ago. A fifth type of arousal response has been called initial arousal response. This response starts with one or two diphasic high voltage central waves, which are either followed by a brief train of maximum frontal fast waves, and then by a brief train of frontal delta this delta activity usually lasts for less than 10 seconds and is followed by a full or an aborted arousal. Another possibility is that the diphasic central chopper wave transients to which we previously alluded 
would be followed by a brief train of central thus activity. And then by generalized predominant frontal delta activity prior to a full or aborted arousal. So the answer to this question is false. B. Next question. The answer to this question is C. Next question. Which of the following is not true regarding initial arousal response? A. Occurs from any sleep stage. B. Initial central diphasic slow waves are present. C. Associated with rhythmic activity in the 8 to 14 hertz range. D. Intermix spike and wave discharges are not present in the initial arousal response. Initial arousal response must be differentiated from stimulus-induced seizures. It tends to occur from a sleep stage 2 and 3. The response is accompanied by clinical or polysomnographic evidence of arousal most of the time. This activity is best appreciated using double banana with transverse chains. The initial waveform are high voltage diphasic central waves. These waves have a duration of a of a, of 500 to 1000 milliseconds. This wave can be better appreciated in this epoch, which shows them to be, as we previously mentioned, them diphasic and located in the central region, though appears in this epoch to be involving the occipital area too. This Waves are followed by brief train of faster activity than the activity that was present prior to the large diphasic waves. The activity following the diphasic waves is in the 8 to 12 hertz range, and then this activity is followed by frontal dominant higher amplitude and slower activity. This latest activity is at times referred to as post-arousal hypersynchrony and may be present diffusely although more prominently in the frontal region. The initial discharge has an initial positive field and then a negative field component when viewed from CZ. This activity tends to occur synchronous and symmetrical. The initial arousal response ends with full awakening or an abortive arousal. The defining features of this activity is its onset during a sleep, following a stimulus, the initial central location of the very high voltage activity, and evidence of wakefulness or abortive arousal at the end of it. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. Look at this epoch and 
choose the best possible answer. A. Lambda wave. B. Mu rhythm. C. Parayotopolos spike. D. Post. The answer is C. Next question. Which of the following occipital discharges do not occur with eye close? A. Lambda wave. B. Posterior slow wave of youth. D. Occipital epileptic discharges. T. Oirda. Parayotopoulos spikes is obviously a Greek name that is hard to pronounce. They are also called benign occipital epilepsy of childhood spikes. The entities that need to be distinguished from this activity are lambda waves, posterior slow wave of youth, and oirda. This type of spikes may appear during wakefulness, but they may also occur during stage 1 of drowsiness, and also they may occur during sleep. During sleep, they usually occur during stage 2 and 3. Panagiotopoulos spikes, when present with eyes open, they disappear when the eyes are closed. These produce an eye, an eye movement artifact that is easily appreciated in the epoch being viewed. These spikes are easily appreciated using double banana, preferable with transverse chain to the occipital region. The typical spike may be followed by a slow wave, as you can see in this frame, or be a monophasic spike, or a biphasic spike. The spikes are usually larger than 100 microvolts, and often the spikes is less than 70 milliseconds. In this frame, you can see what happens when the eyes are closed and what happens when the eyes are open. You can see a single spike or you also can see them occurring in a run as you can see in this frame. The run is made of irregular spikes. The frequency of these spikes within the run is of 3 to 5 hertz. They are occipital negative waves. Most often these spikes are synchronous and symmetrical, but at times they may be uni unilateral or at least may be present only on one side for the duration of a recording that is usually 20 minutes. Often if the recording is prolonged you get to see that they are actually bilateral. The main thing with reactivity is the, fast, is the fact that they are suppressed by eye opening and therefore by visual fixation. I have pointed this out here again in this frame to make sure that you don't forget it. This is a new frame and you can see that 
activity occurring when the eyes are closed and then when the eyes are open that the spikes completely disappear. Here the eyes are closed and here the eyes are open. As we said before, they are suppressed by eye opening and visual fixation. They are not activated by photic stimulation. On the contrary, at heart rate of a stimulation, they are inhibited. Their defining features are their posterior location, their negative feel, the disappearance with eye opening, the lack of activation with photic stimulation, but most importantly, they disrupt the occipital background activity, which is usually not a feature in any of the any of the other sharp activity that occurs in the occipital area. So remember, the disappearance of activity with eye opening is not only a characteristic of alpha activity, but may also occur with pathological activities such as Panagiotopoulos spikes and oida. So the answer to this question is a. Next question. Please look at this epoch and choose which of the following is the best choice. A. Lambda wave. B. Occipital epilepsy. C. Blind needles. D posterior sharp transient of sleep. The answer to this question is A. Next question. Which of the following is true regarding lambda waves? A. Has a consistent morphology. B. Most prominent wave is always positive. C. Disappears when looking at a blank paper. D. An asymmetry of 50% is abnormal. Lambda waves are called so because they resemble the lambda letter in the Greek alphabet. They are usually first noted at the age of two years and are often seen up to the age of 15 years. After that, they become less frequent, but they, are, they still can be seen in the adults. But lambda waves may also be seen before two years of age. This epoch shown in this frame indicates some waves by a pointed arrow. They are lambda waves. This epoch was published in Aminov book as an example of lambda wave occurring in healthy full term at two months of age. Lambda waves can be confused with occipital epileptiform discharges, posterior slow wave of youth, and oida. Lambda waves occur during a wake, often accompanied by eye movements. I like to introduce in this frame an epoch because it shows the association 
between lambda waves and eye movements very clearly. You can see the eye movement at FP1 and also from FP2. Lambda waves are nicely appreciated using double banana with added transverse chains, especially going through the occipital lobe. In its classical form, it has the lambda appearance that we just referred to initially when we started talking about them. The amplitude is about 20 to 50 microvolts and the duration is between 100 and 250 microseconds. But in many cases they do not look so typical and they may also be negative at the occipital region, wider or thinner, and even they may have the shape of a sawtooth appearance. They may occur as a single wave, as is highlighted here by the green color. They may also occur as rones or train, with each wave maintaining their individual characteristics. And they can also occur like a rhythm, that is, when the wave loses the individual characteristic and they look uh, very much just like sharp waves, most likely this is a function of the fact of the fact that they tend to go faster, that is rhythm tend to be faster than, than trains. The frequency of lambda wave ranges between 1 and 6 Hz. They may be positive, that is they may have a positive feel in the occipital area or they may have a negative feel in the occipital area. They can be synchronous and symmetrical, or they can also be unilateral. But in long recording, usually, you get to see them on both uh, hemispheres. The classical presentation is as a patient read the newspaper and move his field of vision from one area to the other you see the eye movement artifacts and you also see the lambda waves Lambda waves are blocked by looking at a blank page and in most cases they are also blocked by closing the eyes and putting them at rest. Their distinguishing features are the presence in the occipital area, their sharpness, the fact that they are linked to eye movement and that they disappeared when looking at a blank page. Some details regarding lambda waves appear different in different textbooks. Fish, e.g. Primer, states that a marked asymmetry suggests abnormality on the side of the lower amplitude, and that lambda wave persists in association with eye movements in the dark. In Levine and Luther's book, they describe that the waveform is, has an initial small positive phase followed by a prominent negative phase, and that lambda attenuates with eye closure, it also attenuates with, with reduction in illumination 
and also by staring at a blank card. In Ebersal's book, they make several comments about Lambda Wave, and these comments are Eye closure, diminution of illumination, staring at a blank card eliminates lambda waves. The description of the wave is similar as in Levin books. That is, there is a small initial positive phase and a prominent subsequent negative phase. But they also state that by computer, most prominent wave is negative in the occipital region. However, clinically, the most prominent phase is positive. And they make a comment that even when present in only one side, that it may be normal. I think that this is because the studies have, were not long because in, I think that when they are long, you will probably see them in both hemispheres. Finally, they conclude that asymmetrical lambda is normal. So the answer to this question is C. Next question. Please take a look at this epoch and choose the most likely correct answer. A, lambda wave, B, occipital epilepsy, C, blind needles, D, posterior sharp transient of sleep. The answer is blind needles. Next question. Which of the following is true regarding occipital spike of the blind? A, usually symmetrical. B, not followed by a slow wave or irregularity. C, the spike component is always very thin. D, best seen in common average montage. Occipital spike of the blind has to be distinguished from occipital epilepsy from discharges from lambda waves post and posterior slow wave of youth. They occur in any behavioral stage. They are not accompanied by any artifacts. They are best appreciated using ipsilateral ear montage. They can occur in runs of spikes and wave complexes, as you can see in this frame. Notice that the spike does not keep the same relation to the slow wave. Here, the spike is in the descending phase of the slow wave. Here, the spike is in the ascending phase of the slow wave. At times, the spike and wave is single and the spike is monophasic. At times, the spike is biphasic. And at times, there's no slow wave. There's only a spike, which can also be biphasic. The frequency of the isolated wave is from 1 to 10 hertz. This is uh, an epoch which I show you uh, the characteristic wave. When I was talking to you about the characteristic of each wave, and you can see the rhythmic activity occurring from the left occipital area. Most waveforms have a negative field in the occipital region, but some have a positive field, a little bit the same as the 
lambda waves. Some are symmetrical and synchronous, but some tend to be unilateral. The defining features is that they occurred in a blind person, and it is important to remember that they are not linked to an increased incidence of seizures. So the answer to this question is C. Next question. Look at this frame and choose the best answer. A. Lambda waves. B. Ictal activity. C. Wicked spike. D. Phantom wave. The answer is C. Next question. Which of the following is not true regarding, regarding wicked spikes? A. May be asymmetrical. B. Focus is usually anterior or middle temporal. C. The spike is symmetrical. D. The waves in the burst are blunted. Wicked is a term used to describe a small gate in a big fence. Wicked must be distinguished from epileptiform discharges. They occur during any behavioral stage. They are not associated with any artifacts. They are well appreciated use, using double banana montage. The waves are quite symmetrical and usually monophasic with an apical contour or they can occur in a burst of variable amplitude producing a sinusoidal envelope. When part of a burst, the frequency of the individual wave is between 6 and 11 Hz. Wicked produce a field with maximal activity in the anterior or mid temporal region, which is negative in those areas. Wicked may be synchronous and symmetrical or unilateral. They have no special reactivity and each spike tends to be very symmetrical and that is the main defining features of wicked spikes. This is especially important when we are dealing with single spikes and making a decision whether we feel it is epileptiform or not. A spike that tends to be very symmetrical is less likely to be an indication, an indication that the patient has epilepsy than if it is asymmetrical. In addition to the shape or the waveform, another feature that is very characteristic is the distribution, which tend to be maximal in the anterior or middle temporal region. So the answer to this question is D. Next question. Take a look at this epoch and choose the best answer. A. Lambda waves. B. Occipital epilepsy. C. Posterior slow waves of youth. D. Posterior sharp transients of sleep. The answer is posterior slow wave of youth. Next question. Which of the following is not true regarding posterior slow wave of youth? A. Blocked by stress. B. Blocked by eye opening. C. Enhanced by hyperventilation. D. 
second half better define that first half. Posterior slow wave of youth is a slow alpha variant. This activity is most prominent from 8 to 14 years of age, but it can be seen after 2 years of age and up to the age of 21 years. Posterior slow wave of youth should be differentiated from occipital slowing, occipital epileptic discharges, and post. It occurs during a week. There is no guiding artifact. It is best appreciated by using its lateral ear montage, but it can also be appreciated by using banana montage, that is double banana montage. The wave has a duration of three to six times the ongoing alpha activity and usually the second half of the wave here in pink has better form superimposed alpha activity than the first half here represented in aqua. This is when we are looking at it from the right occipital to the right ear or the left occipital to the left ear. The amplitude of the wave is usually less than 1.5 of the alpha activity. The best definition that I can think of is basically what I just told you before. It is like a delta wave with a fuse alpha activity, which is better defined in the second half. But it is not always so. Sometimes the first half has better definition than the second half, but most of the time the second half has better definition. The frequency of it is in the delta range and it can and it can occur as a train of, of waves, one following the other, sometimes lasting up to uh, five seconds. The activity is mainly, mainly posterior and involves the negative region, specifically the occipital region. It tends to be synchronous and symmetrical. So it's very much the same as regular alpha activity. This activity is blocked by eye opening since it behaves the same as alpha wave and is usually also blocked by drowsiness and light sleep. It seems to be enhanced by hyperventilation and stress. In other words, it behaves like any other alpha rhythm would, therefore we classify this behavior as alpha rhythm behavior. I think that its most defining feature is the fact that you will see a delta wave that changes mind in became an alpha wave. Uh, another defining feature is the fact that it occurs in the occipital region and that most of the time is better defined in the second half than in the first than in the first half of the delta wave. When I talk about defining, I'm talking about definition of the of the alpha rhythm. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. Please look at this epoch and choose the better answer. A. Lambda wave. D. Cerda. C. 
Siganic rhythm, D, rhythmic temporal, theta burst of drowsiness. The answer is B. Next question. Which of the following is true regarding Srita? A. Occurs mainly in elderly when awake. B. Lasts less than 5 seconds. C. Waves have a notch appearance. D. There is no change in frequency during the event. Subclinical rhythmic EEG discharges of adults are unlikely to be seen in children. They occur primarily in adults, mainly in elderly patients. Srida should be differentiated from rhythmic mid temporal theta, theta discharges from ictal activity, from siganek rhythm, and from mu rhythm. They classically occur during a week, but at times they can also be seen during drowsiness. And even early in a sleep. They are intermingled with artifacts produced by hyperventilation and at times photic stimulation. The waveforms are well appreciated using double banana with transfer chains. They are often better analyzed when we use referential montage to ipsilateral ears. Waveform usually start with a sharp contour and ends in a sinusoidal pattern. But at times, the sinusoidal component is not present. Srida starts as a slow delta and progress progressively becomes a fast theta. It may have a negative field maximal at the vertex or sometimes has fields that are either localized to one temporal region or both temporal regions. Sarda is usually synchronous and symmetrical. It may be triggered by hyperventilation and photic stimulation, alerting procedures or mental activation such as adding. It is not blocked or activated by eye opening or closing. Their defining features are their fields that is negative and maximal at the vertex most of the time or at the central regions occasionally their change in frequency that go from delta to theta and its shape that goes from a spiky to sinusoidal. Most importantly, throughout this episode where this activity is being viewed in the EEG, the patient is always wondering what's going on because the patient will be able to answer questions and even do simple math while you're looking at the sharp activity in the EEG. This is an example. Notice the distribution 
the frequency and the shape of the waveforms. Please notice the evolution, the rhythm and the waves go through time. At this point, which is a continuation of the previous epoch, the activity is mainly sinusoidal. So, as you can see, or reading this frame, there are two forms of Srida. One, which is characterized by an abrupt monophasic series of repetitive sharp or slow wave that appear focally at the vertex, recurring in progressively shorter interval until sustained sinusoidal rhythm develops, which is the one that I just introduced to you before, and a second form that is characterized by, by bilateral episodic burst of rhythmic sharply contour 5 to 7 hertz theta frequencies appearing maximally over the temporal parietal derivations. Uh, in a paper published in 2006, which supported a prior uh, concept published in 1961, it is described that since Rida has a posterior hemispheric source in some cases, that is in the temporal parietal type, and that it occurs during hyperventilation, that this constellation may represent a link to a vulnerable area in the brain, which is the vascular watershed area that is in the temporal parietal region, and that hyperventilation, since it produces vasoconstriction, triggers it. So the answer to this question is A. Occurs mainly in early when awake. Next question. Please look at this epoch and choose the most appropriate answer. A. Five rhythm. B. Sharp oida. C. Slow alpha variant. D. Lambda waves. The answer is a slow alpha variant. Next question. Which of the following is not true regarding slow alpha variant? A. Waves may be notched. B. Blocked by eye opening. C. Enhanced by eye closure. D. Usually in the slow delta range. So, a slow alpha variant is another variant of alpha activity. It must be distinguished from rhythmic mid-temporal theta discharge of drowsiness, from ictal activity, from strida, from post, and from lambda waves. It occurs during a week it is not associated with any specific artifact and it can be well appreciated using common electrodes uh, to ipsilateral ear or double banana, especially if FC and CC are connected as well as CC and PZ are connected. The fundamental activity has a sharp contour on the occipital side and a notch appearance on the opposite side. The amplitude of this activity ranges from 50 to 100 microvolts. The basic rhythm is a superharmonic of alpha According to Fish, the most prevalent rhythm is either 3.5 or 6.5 Hz. A slow alpha activity may occur 
and brief runs or long trains. The activity is maximal on the occipital or posterior cerebral region. They tend to be synchronous and symmetrical. Slow alpha activity is blocked by eye opening, same as any other alpha activity. They are also blocked by drowsiness at sleep as well as by any by everything that blocks regular alpha activity. A slow alpha activity is enhanced by hyperventilation and stress. In other words, slow alpha activity behaves exactly the same as alpha rhythm in general. The defining features is its relation with the regular alpha activity and its frequency which should be a super harmonic of the prevalent alpha rhythm. So the answer to this question is the answer to this question is D. Next question. Take a look at this frame and choose best possible answer. A. Five rhythm. B. Sharp oirta. C. Slow alpha variant. D. Lambda waves. The answer is five rhythm. Next question. Which of the following is not true regarding five rhythm? A. More common during a wake. B. Link to blinking. C. Link to seizures. D. Amplitude less than 50 microvolts. Five rhythm occurs in children and young adults. Phi rhythm must be distinguished from ictal activity and from lambda waves. It occurs during wakefulness. It is linked to blinking and therefore blinking artifact will be present. It is well appreciated using double banana and sometimes better analyzed using ipsilateral ear referential montage. The waveforms are in the delta range and other range in a burst. The initial wave tend to be smaller than the subsequent waves. The maximal wave occurs shortly after the initial wave and then after that there's a decremented amplitude which is uh, relatively slow and progressive. The amplitude of the tallest wave is usually from 200 to 300 microvolts. The frequency of the individual wave is in the delta range as we just as we previously mentioned. And they are usually arranged in trains of up to three seconds. Phi rhythm is uh, maximally posterior. It typically is synchronous and symmetrical, but at times may have alternating symmetry. They are triggered by eye closure and they are too attenuate with eye opening and may fatigue after repeat testing. So if you ask the patient to do it too many times, at the beginning you will see it, at the end you will not. Their defining feature are the presence of brief delta run lasting for less than three seconds triggered by eye closure. The significance of phi rhythm is that they are not epileptic and should not be confused with epileptiform activity. The answer to this question is 
C. Next question. Please look at this epoch and choose the best possible answer. The best answer is B. Next question. Which of the following is not true regarding slow lambda of youth? A occurs 200 milliseconds after eye closure. B wave is about 300 microvolts. C more frequent in adults. D wave is in the delta range. A slow lambda of youth occurs with shutting of the eyelids. So they are most, most often called shot eye waves. Shot eye waves are most common during the ages of two and three years, but they may occur as early as six months and they may be present up to the age of 10 years. They should be distinguished from occipital delta, delta slowing, phi rhythm, and lambda waves. Short eye waves occur during a wake. They are linked to eyelid movements, so eye, eyelid artifacts will be seen in the EEG. They are easily detected using bipolar montage better analyzed using ipsilateral ear reference montage. Short eye waves consist of single waves at times sharp with a frequency of 200 to 400 microvolts. The activity is in the delta range. It is maximal over the posterior region, either negative or positive in the occipital electrodes. The waves are usually bilateral, they are usually symmetrical, but they may also ho have alternating asymmetries. The wave occurred 100 to 500 milliseconds after eye closure. It attenuates with eye opening and may fatigue if done repetitively. In this, they very much resemble phi rhythm. Their defining feature is the presence of single occipital delta immediately after eye closure. So the answer to this question is C. Next question, please look at this epoch and choose the best possible answer. A, Firda, B, eye movement, one eye, C, hepatic coma, D, theta waves. The answer is theta waves. Next question, theta waves are associated with the structural brain lesions, A true, B false. Theta waves occur at any age. Their main differential diagnosis is with polymorphic frontal slowing, but they also have to be differentiated from, from FIRDA. They can occur anytime they are not linked to any artifacts. They are best seen using double banana with transfer run, especially going through the frontal region. The wave view using FP2 to F4 derivation has a sawtooth appearance and is very constant in its shape the wave may last from 350 all the way to 
2500 milliseconds that is up to two and a half seconds the amplitude of this wave is between 30 and 260 60 microvolts it occurs as a single wave or in very short trains of two to five waves the fields maximal either in one or the other frontal region since it's always very it's lateralized they produce a very asymmetrical wave which has no specific reactivity the defining feature of theta waves is the large sawtooth frontal delta activity occurring by itself or in a brief run so the answer to this question is a this uh, part of the talk i call it putting it all together because i will try to summarize uh, everything that we have spoken in the last four lectures i will try to make it as easy as possible so in the next frames i am going to show you occipital derivations belonging to it to, to the epochs that i have shown you in the course of this talk as I just said, they are all occipital derivations. Please make an attempt to match them with the appropriate label. Let's start. So the top one is post. The next one, lambda. The next one, slow alpha. This one, I hope that you remember, is called blind spikes because they occur in blind people. Next one is five rhythm. Next one again is blind spike. Next one is fold. That is six per second spike and wave or, or one type of phantom waves. This one is Panagitopoulos spikes. And the last one is posterior slow wave of youth. In this frame, I am introducing an approach to suspicious occipital activity. First, notice if the occipital activity is an expression of, ex of a generalized rhythm. And if it is so, analyze it accordingly. That is according to the predominant location. On the other hand, if the occipital activity is the predominant activity, then see if the patient is blind. If the patient is blind, you are more likely to be dealing with a spike of blind than with any other type of occipital activity. Then notice if the occipital activity is associated with eye movement artifacts and if the artifact is consistent with eye closure. If after eye closure what follows is their disappearance then you are likely to be dealing with posterior slow wave of youth panagiotopoulos spikes alpha variant or occipital intermittent rhythmic delta activity next go back to the artifact and see whether the EMG artifact looks like eye opening 
or at, or at closing. If you see the suspicious activity appearing at that time, then if the eyes are open, it's likely to be lambda. If the eyes are closed, that is if the artifact suggests eye closure, then it's likely to be phi rhythm or short eye waves. If highly localized occipital activity occurs during a stage one or two of a sleep, then consider positive occipital sharp transient of a sleep. If the activity is positive at the occipital electrode, if negative, consider false panagitopoulos spikes. And if the activity is not sharp, then consider the possibility of cone waves in OIRDA. Now I am going to try to do the same with activity that is prominent over the frontal region. If the activity, the suspicious activity in the frontal region is an expression of a generalized rhythm, then look for the predominant location and try to work it out from there. If on the other hand it is highly localized to the frontal region and the activity consists of a spike and waves, you should think of frontal arousal responses, hypnocogic hyper hypersynchronicity, mitten pattern, WAM, which is a form of phantom waves huge N waves or an epileptiform element. Remember the relation between the spike and the slow wave which is fixed in epileptiform elements and not so much in normal variants. If the wave is highly localized and slow, consider the possibility of a frontal arousal response in hypnagogic hypersynchronicity. If it is very slow and the patient is sleep, consider delta wave, zeta wave, or firda. If the patient is awake, consider the possibility of zeta waves and firda. Remember that spindles and K complexes may also occur with a predominance in the frontal region. Now I will attempt to do the same for central activity. Suspicious central activity is best considered whether it is or it has an interictal like appearance characterized by single wave of brief complexes, in which case it is important to know whether they whether it is maximal at CC, which should make us think of the possibility of V waves or K complexes, or if it is maximal at C3 or C4, in which case we should think of the possibility of epileptiform activity. If on the other hand the activity present in the central region is ictal-like and the maximal activity is at the level of CC, then we should think of the possibility of Siganek rhythm. If it's maximal as C3 or 4 or C4, then we must consider the possibility of move rhythm, spindles, 
subclinical rhythmic electroencephalographic discharges of the adult, hypnopompic hypersynchronicity, or an initial arousal response. If, on the other hand, the ictal-like acti activity occurs during REM, then we should think of sawtooth waves. Now, I will do the same with temporal lobe activity. Suspicious activity arising from the temporal lobe should be divided into those that look like interictal-like activity. If they are enhanced, or if they can see, they can be seen better by referring the activity to the contralateral ear. Most likely, we're dealing with pets. If they do not, then it is most likely that we're dealing with epileptic form activity. If the activity in the temporal lobe is ictal-like, then we must think about the polarity. If it is positive, we are likely to be, be dealing with 14 and 6 positive bursts. If negative, then we're likely to be dealing with rhythmic mid-temporal discharges of drowsiness, subclinical rhythmic electroencephalographic discharges of adult, wicked spikes, or temporal intermittent rhythmic delta activity. If the suspicious temporal activity, which has an ictal-like appearance, is occurring during a wake, then we must ask ourselves whether there is changing frequency or not. If there is changing frequency, then we must consider Srita as the most likely entity, that is subclinical rhythmic electroencephalographic discharges of, ad of adult. On the other hand, if there is no change in, in frequency, then most likely we're dealing with rhythmic mid-temporal discharges. Finally, let us not forget the nameless benign variant. You will find plenty of them when you read EEGs. This term refers to fluctuations in normal rhythms that produce apiculate spike-like waveforms that do not fit into a well-described EEG waveform variant, the ones that we have been talking about in the last four lectures. This nameless benign variant consists of spiky fragments and isolated alpha rhythm waves. Extension of sharp alpha activity to the temporal regions and to waveforms that are the product of a combination of alpha with theta and beta waves, that is superimposition of these waveforms. In the next four frame, I am I'm going to show you the tables which you had seen during the, the first, the second, and the third talk in this cycle. You may see that they are a little bit different, and that is because I have made some changes as I go along uh, with the lectures. So this table is about activity found in the occipital lobe. Take a few seconds to look at it or a few minutes and go through it carefully. This one 
is about the frontal lobe that is the the benign variance in in general grapho elements that you may find in the frontal lobe please look at them and i stop the video if you must and go back as often as you need to in order to get a good uh, understanding of them this new frame is about central activity and this one is about temporal lobe activity thank you very much for your attention